Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. Today we're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance for one of their celebrity lectures. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. Today we have a gentleman with us who has experienced some extraordinary things in his life and he's here today to share them with us. Um, his date of birth is 12 September 1937, but his date of loss was 4 February 1967. A few things he wrote, happiness is unity before self, happiness is peace, it is red, white, and blue, and it's the United States of America. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to introduce John Furr. Thank you. And thank you, Cindy, very much for that kind introduction. I'm, uh, I'm very pleased to be here today uh, because I think most of you are about my age. <laughs> and although I like to see uh, the young folks here too because to use that cliche, they are the wave of the future. They are the future. If we can avoid what Ho Chi Minh used to say, capturing the minds and the hearts of the young people and I'll control the nation, if we can avoid that sort of political overtone and let our free enterprise American exceptionalism determine our future as has determined our past from our founding, I think we're going to be in great shape uh, for the long, long, long term. And especially it's due to folks like yourself. The uh, pre-boomer generation, the pre-XYZers and all that other stuff that uh, that psychologists, psychiatrists, and the media like to assign to people. We love phrases. Americans love phrases. Uh, as Cindy mentioned to you, I'm John Furr. I was born just down the road here in San Pedro uh, in, uh, in 30, 1937, and I went all through school at, uh, in San Pedro. I, I uh, graduated from San Pedro High School, and I, I went off to USC to study aeronautical engineering well, for three years. Uh, each of those three years, I had been trying to get an appointment to the Air Force Academy. That was my goal. Because ever since I was uh, even younger than this young fellow in the front row, I'd been building model airplanes and flying model airplanes. And one of my dearest, 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 uh, and closest friends who's since passed away, some of you may recall the name, Les Pates, Lester Pates, was uh, a commercial pilot out here. In other words, he, would, he gave lessons uh, all the way from private to the commercial level. And he was in partnership with a, a fella here that I, whose name I can't remember right now, but had a, a pilot's license in a number less than 10. It was so low. Uh, he had been in aviation that long. And I can't think of it, it was a hard bitten old cuss, but new flying inside and out. And I'll never forget, when I walked into their office, this fellow had on the wall a sign which said, flying spoken here. And that's exactly what took place in, in that office and in the air. Uh, excellent instruction, all good flying talk. It's an old map, but uh, it generally gives you an idea of the geographical layout of uh, Indochina. Uh, Siam, of course, now is called Thailand. There's a footnote at the bottom which you can't see. And this article uh, where this map uh, uh, was extracted uh, was done by a fellow by the name of Bernard Fall, who was an expert in uh, Indochina. Was killed, uh, as I recall, uh, while he was covering the war over there. But anyway, uh, you can see uh, the, uh, the three countries, uh, Cambodia, uh, Laos and uh, Vietnam, which at this, uh, at this point of the map is divided into North and South Vietnam. And we can see just above Hue uh, there uh, and above the word Anam, uh, which is the central part of, of Vietnam, there is a dashed line, that's a 17th parallel. Now that's the line that, to put this in perspective again, that's the line that was drawn, so to speak, as a result of the defeat of the French at Dien Bien Phu and their, uh, and their departure from, essentially military departure, 
and political departure from, uh, from Indochina, specifically uh, Vietnam. And you can see Dien Bien Phu uh, slightly below that word in China, the Chinese province Yunnan. Okay, Dien Bien Phu was, of course, that great big fort that was in a valley and which uh, General Jiap uh, just pulverized before they overran it by mounting his artillery on the backside of the mountain. He didn't carry it over the top where it could be targeted uh, by uh, airdrops, napalm and artillery and bombs and things like that. He put it on the backside, so he fired over the backside of the mountains. The French couldn't get at him. So uh, that's the, 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 the real strategic uh, 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 implementation of, uh, of firepower uh, artillery which uh, defeated the French. Then they, they, they left and then there were uh, peace talks that took place in Paris uh, to determine the future of Vietnam and uh, the outcome was in 1954 uh, following uh, the French defeat that it would be partitioned north and south. The uh, south would be uh, allied with uh, primarily the United States, certainly the west, and the North uh, would be, uh, by their choice, under the Viet Minh, which was a front organization for the communists, uh, they would be allied with China and uh, People's Republic and uh, the Soviet Union. And they were supplied and supported uh, in other ways by them while we did uh, South Vietnam. Now, South Vietnam, the way, reason we got in there was under the umbrella, of, besides our own strategic interests, uh, under the umbrella of the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, CETO, which included Australia, New Zealand, and the countries in this general area. Youngsters, there'll be a quiz after this is over, so take notes. <laughs> One of the weaknesses of our American public school system uh, is that we do not stress geography enough. We do not stress geography. So it's very important, and that's one of the reasons I'm giving this little background uh, to the young folks here. Anyway, we got engaged in there, and uh, the, uh, the government was uh, uh, allied with the United States and vice versa. And so about 1961, we started getting more and, deep, more, and more deeply involved with advisors on the ground, uh, instructing their pilots with B uh, B-26s and uh, T-28s and things like that, just strapping uh, bomb racks on them. And, uh, and, uh, you know, getting them up to speed militarily. You have to remember too, you have to remember too, that the North under Ho Chi Minh never, ever, ever, ever gave up on their goal of unifying Vietnam, both North and South. Never. He founded the Indochina Communist Party in 1930 and was a, was a uh, he liked to say a, a nationalist, but there were strong undertones of Marxism and uh, Leninism and all that stuff that uh, the communists like to spout. So anyway, immediately he started then infiltration uh, and with advise, his own advisors and getting the Viet Cong, which was a, an indigenous uh, fighting force, uh, involved in attempting to overthrow the uh, Saigon, as they call it, the Saigon government. And you can see Saigon at the very, very tip down there by Cape Kamau just across from Phnom Penh, uh, uh, Cambodia, or uh, the Khmer Republic, as they say. Uh, I went through uh, T-Birds uh, down at uh, Laredo Air Force Base on the, on the border of, uh, of Mexico. I got uh, checked out as a, as a uh, primary pilot in this little device, the Tweety Bird, and it got its name Tweety Bird, uh, made by Cessna, uh, because it screamed so loud. It had a loud tweet sound to the engines. and uh, it was side-by-side -side seating, as you know, and uh, uh, an excellent primary bird. It was very, very difficult to, uh, to make errors and not recover from it, even a flat spin. It was a very good airplane, subsonic, uh, but an excellent airplane. Now, this is, my, this is my B-66 class. You can't see it very well, I'm sure, but uh, these are the guys that checked out uh, in the combat crew training squadron down at Shaw Air Force Base, which was the recce school at the time. They had just gotten in the RF-4s, but they still had us uh, checking out in the, uh, the B-66. And we all got checked out in the uh, RB-66, which was the photo bird, uh, because we didn't have any C models or B models of the B-66, which had all the jamming gear on it and the pod in the back end. 
when I got to, uh, to Thailand in order to fly these missions over the north, we moved into uh, Takli Air Base. And Takli Air Base, uh, in addition to the usual uh, support uh, facilities, had uh, housing for the pilots. Uh, and we called these, these hooches. In this slide here, you can see uh, looking down the uh, sidewalk or the boardwalk uh, between all the hooches, a uh, gathering of the uh, young men who uh, did the housekeeping, and that's, uh, uh, those are who, who we called the hooch boys. And this is my hooch boy and uh, the hooch where I live, the uh, facility that, uh, that uh, housed uh, probably a dozen other uh, pilots or other air crew members. And that's me uh, in, uh, in civilian clothes. I was his first lieutenant at the time. This was in uh, 1966, the fall of 66. And that's my, uh, my quarters, my little uh, share of the world there with uh, mosquito net and, uh, and my bed. Now, in, uh, in December, in December of 1966, as part of his, his visits to the, uh, the troops during, during the war, uh, Bob Hope came to talk Lee. And here he is, he already had lunch, and he's coming out uh, of the uh, uh, officer's mess at Talk Lee. And I happened to be outside waiting for him, so I snapped this picture. And Bob Hope, again, he's getting in there with the base commander the fellow in the glasses, uh, he's getting into the Jeep and he's about ready to go back to the, to the airplane, the C-130 that they flew in on. And the last one, that's the ambassador to Thailand uh, who came up uh, to be with Bob Hope uh, at the club and uh, they're about uh, to say goodbye and he's headed to the airplane as I said. Uh, this is shortly after I had arrived uh, in, uh, in Southeast Asia and uh, most of you will, uh, if you've seen the 66, will recognize it. A camouflaged airplane, and that's the intrepid warrior there about to get in. Uh, the beauty about this airplane was it only had uh, one pilot, one pilot. And I loved it, because I, I came out of B-47s into this thing. And I always sat in the back, and even the navigator told me what to do. As a co-pilot, I sat there and I ran the gun, and I, I read the checklist, and uh, I, I computed the fuel flow and all this other stuff, and I made the radio calls, but there wasn't much action. And backseat landings were not very uh, often given to co-pilots because if you hit the, the aft tandem gear first, you took a huge porpoise in the air, and that was dangerous in a B-47. So anyway, I loved this airplane because it had only one pilot, and uh, I was a first lieutenant at the time, and it was a real thrill to be an aircraft commander. I had a navigator, um, and a, uh, a uh, crew in the back. Now, if you look directly behind me and sort of between the gear, in there is, um, is a pod where the bomb bay used to be, and that's where there were four uh, electronic warfare officers, Ravens, and uh, those guys back there did all the hard work. They did the heavy lifting, listening for uh, AAA uh, radar uh, acquisition and tracking, and the SAM, the most deadly, the SAM, surface-to-air missiles. Uh, that we were supposed to jam. We were supposed to jam all of it, but uh, the SAMs were the really dangerous ones. Uh, and when they were in airborne, they looked like big telephone poles. Okay, so uh, this, is, uh, this is one of the F-4s. Whenever we flew north, whenever we flew north, we always had a flight of four escorts. Early on, we used to have uh, the F-104s, because that's all they had. They used them for air-to-air, uh, -air. Uh, uh, intercepts and things like that and then when they weren't busy doing that sort of stuff they would fly escorts for us but they burned gas like nobody's business had no legs and uh, while they could shoot down MiGs and things like that the MiGs never launched very often to uh, to intercept us so they got rid of the uh, 104s and uh, they kept them around uh, Saigon and that area there so they could go into air defense there uh, in case the North ever came south with their, uh, their aircraft. But anyway, the uh, Air Force then got the F-4s, and this was one of our escorts. Uh, he came up alongside. I asked him so I could take a picture. Anyway, he, he flew up there. They came from the Triple Nickel Squadron mostly, which was uh, J uh, uh, Jappy James and uh, Robin Old's uh, wing over in, uh, in uh, uh, Udorn, or Ubon, excuse me, Ubon, over near the Laotian border. And so they would fly, uh, be four of them that would come up and uh, we'd stack 
and I'll get into this a little more too. We'd stack 2,000 feet above one another. Uh, two of us, I, I was in the C model, I'd be at the about 32,000, and below us uh, uh, at 30,000 would be uh, the B model. Okay, jam only. B model was just a barrage jammer. They just turned everything on and jammed certain frequencies. We were selective. We could jam and we could uh, cut and we could figure out what different frequencies were so we could adjust to it and that sort of thing. If anything new came, if anything new came up. Just a little bit above that dot that says Bangkok. It's where the air base of Tok Lee is located. I would fly from Tok Lee. We would fly north. Right to the junction of the, uh, Ta or the uh, Vietnamese and uh, Laotian border. Okay, you can see Laos. And there was a, uh, a, a TACAN station located on a, on a hill. A Lima site, we called them. Uh, which was lightly defended by uh, uh, special forces guys and some Air Force people to operate the, the electronics there. And we would fly, channel 79 was the, was the, uh, was the channel number for that tack and we'd fly just about due north, it'd be 001 to the tack an site, 79, and then we'd turn just a little bit to the uh, uh, east-northeast and come in on the back side of the, um, uh, the uh, city of Hanoi, just across the Red River. And I'll just draw, I'll draw that for you. We go up about this, this uh, track, and then we turn in, and we fly an orbit north of Hanoi, which is right here, north of Hanoi, east and west. We fly this orbit east and west, um, and I mentioned 32,000 for me is the C model, and the B model would be at uh, uh, 30,000 feet. And we had to stay about uh, 20 miles south of the Chinese border. Now, naturally, this is a different scale, but there, were, there was a line that followed the Chinese border that was about 20 miles uh, south of the border and sort of paralleling the border itself and we had to stay out of that area that was called a buffer zone because if we got into an area that was too close to China it scramble our MiGs then we would be in deep trouble because we didn't have any armament and, uh, and of course the F4s would, would defend us but if, if, if they had too many then of course it would be uh, disadvantageous but anyway you can see north of Hanoi an orbit that is east and west, it would alternate as a racetrack, which is your standard oval, or a figure eight. Now we'd go inbound and we'd fly and get ourselves established with, a, with, a, with an oval uh, uh, orbit. And uh, we never went out over the water, but went close to the, uh, to the eastern edge of, of Vietnam. And then we'd turn back uh, turn uh, to the left and then come back again and fly a, a, a ground track that was uh, to the west. And then we'd, we'd get out, oh, I'd say, around um, uh, the other side of the Red River slightly. You can see the mountains coming down uh, by the Red River. That's Thud Ridge. Thud Ridge was the uh, ground identification point that the 105s used to enter Hanoi airspace. So they fly uh, missions out of Karat and Tok Lee at different times during the day, the same route we flew. And then when they entered uh, uh, just past Dien Bien Phu and got close to Thud Ridge, they dropped down to uh, say about 500 feet. And then they'd turn very sharply and they'd come down the Red River or Thud Ridge and they'd come on the western side of the Thud Ridge so they couldn't be picked up on radar. So they'd be masked by the mountains. And we flew above it, of course, because we didn't have any, any, any strike mission, so it didn't make any difference. And we had jammers and, and, uh, and uh, cutters and things like that, so it didn't make any difference. So we would fly on this orbit, oval or figure eight, in anticipation of the arrival of the F-105s uh, uh, and, uh, to a lesser degree, uh, some of the F-4 air-to-ground guys. And it was on, this, uh, on, a, on, on February the 4th, 1967, that I was just established in the orbit. I was just established in the orbit uh, at the, uh, at the uh, eastern end, 
and I was going to turn to the north and then uh, resume the, uh, the ground track going out uh, to the west again, when the, navig when the uh, uh, ravens in the back end said, uh, hold your turn, don't make your turn yet. And I knew when they said that, that, uh, that they were cutting a site that was of some interest. Now, if it was a known site, they wouldn't have said that because we would have just turned on the jammers and jammed them selectively. But he said, hold your turn. So uh, I did that, and I went a little bit further to the east than I ordinarily would. And so uh, about 10, 15 seconds later, the, uh, uh, the head raven, the head uh, electronic warfare officer in the back end, number four, said, okay, start your turn now. Well, the navigator gets antsy when you exceed the, uh, the, the physical parameters of your, of your, uh, your, your uh, uh, area of where you're supposed to fly. And so he said, okay, make this turn a tight turn. So now let me give you some background on the equipment in the back end. The equipment in the back end, if you're flying straight and level, uh, emits a cone-shaped pattern. And it's about 45 degrees, if you can visualize this thing, it's 45 degrees between uh, the horizontal and, uh, and the vertical flight path, okay? So you've got a big cone, it's about 45 degrees. And inside that cone is the uh, effective range of your jamming. So whenever you roll, into a bank, you move that cone a little bit. Well, today, or on this particular day, the 4th of February, it wasn't very smart in retrospect, but we did it anyway, rolled into a bank which was about 60 degrees so I could come back and avoid flying into that buffer zone over, uh, over China in, in the Chinese airspace. Okay. Well, when we rolled over, we projected the, the, the jamming out to the side and it was at that moment that we rolled into the turn, the jamming was ineffective, that the uh, Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese, or it could have been the Russians operating their sites, I don't know, but because the Russians did operate a lot of their sites and fly some of their airplanes. But anyway, when we rolled over, we effectively shut down our jamming, and they fired four SAMs, one right after the other. They all must have come up within 10 seconds. What we had done after the fact, I found out, was flown over an, a mobile site, one that had been moved in overnight. Now, uh, they have a lot of mobile sites, but uh, you have to, number one, you have to detect them electronically, and then you have to photograph them to verify that there's a site there before the intelligence guys will keep them on the missile order of battle. In other words, the charts that we are given in the briefings uh, just before the mission. So this particular mobile site was moved in uh, overnight. We didn't know it was there, but these guys picked it up. The guys on my back end picked it up. Well, when we rolled in, we, sh we effect effectively lost any jamming. They fired four, and two of them did some very severe damage. One of them impacted the airplane, and uh, it killed three of the four guys in the back end right off the bat. Uh, one of the Ravens, the youngest kid, the lieutenant, uh, in the ex inexperienced uh, position, Raven 1, and incidentally, just coincidentally and lucky for him, furthest away from the impact. It came up for the left side, and he sat in the right front seat in, the, in that pod that I described to you. So he got out okay. Uh, we got some shrapnel damage uh, on the left side. The navigator and I were kind of beat up a little bit with, with shrapnel. And as I uh, mentioned to other folks sometimes, I received mine for the most part in the same area that, that, uh, that uh, Forrest Gump uh, got his, and uh, that was in the buttocks. Uh, uh, so I had uh, bloody shorts and undershirt when I, uh, when I uh, uh, punched out of the airplane. Uh, I told the navigator, go ahead, get out of the airplane. I rang the alarm bell for the guys in the back end, a red light, alarm bell, to signal for them to go out. Now they all ejected downward. So when the report of the after action uh, came in from the escorts as to who got out of the airplane, they said only two, suit, only two chutes were sighted. Mine and the navigators, because we went up. He didn't see the one guy eject downward, so they thought all four were killed until a, a good while after uh, our captivity. So anyway, we punched out of the airplane broke it in half, 
uh, uh, the the fighter escort reported uh, that that it broken in half, flaming halves, and that sort of thing, and we ejected and uh, came you know tumbling down through the old uh, uh, atmosphere there. And the one thing I remember to this day is how cold it was, very very cold. This is February, and of course jet stream comes down and uh, cold air uh, pretty much. Uh, uh, blankets that, uh, that part of the, of the world as well as uh, you know other parts of, of the globe. But anyway, uh, our parachutes are set to, if we're incapacitated, to be deployed at 14,000 feet through a barometric system. Okay, when, when the uh, barometer senses 14,000 pressure altitude, it uh, sets a, a, a little uh, a retracting mechanism in, in motion and it pulls the, uh, the D-ring mechanism uh, of its own accord. So if you know, you're unconscious, uh, you, you, you have a nice letdown. Uh, I was tumbling through the air and you know, I, was in sh I couldn't believe that I was shot down for one thing. I'm not, supposed to be, I'm not supposed to be hit. I'm supposed to be outside. I'm supposed to be a jammer and all that sort of stuff. So anyway, I'm tumbling through the air. And when I went out of the airplane, I didn't pull my visor down. So my eyes were hit with the high-speed slipstream. And what that did was rupture uh, uh, my eye, my, uh, the vessels in my eyeballs. Okay? And so they became very blood, uh, almost black uh, uh, in their color. And I couldn't see. So I was tumbling down through the air, cold, in shock, and uh, thinking, what if that parachute barometer doesn't work? Because I couldn't see. I wouldn't know how close I was to the ground. So I reached over, and it must have been about 28,000 or something like that. I pulled uh, the ripcord, and it deployed nicely. And I just swung there, and I said, well, the personal equipment guys had told me this, you, you guide your chute by reaching behind and with one hand opposite and getting the shrouds. And then in the front, you get the other one and you twist them like this and you can guide yourself and slip the parachute and all that other stuff. Because I had seen a village as my eyesight cleared. I saw a village down. I said, these guys are going to be after me. Well, I want to tell you, I must be the weakest guy in the world or I wasn't doing something right because I couldn't move that parachute. I could not slide it. And so I dropped down on the side of a ridge, which was in view of this village as I came down. And uh, I was on the ground and, and um, took all of my, uh, my gear off and I, I buried the chute. And then I went through my survival kit, including the, uh, the survival mirror, which you know you can flash to rescue people and you get their attention and, uh, and they know that you're on the ground. Because I didn't want to use the radio on the guard channel because the Vietnamese monitored the guard channels, 2430. They monitor the guard channel and then they send their, uh, their troops or their militias or whatever it is to that area and uh, they'll, they'll capture you quicker. So I didn't want to use the radio, so I, I, reached, in the, uh, uh, I reached in my survival uh, vest and I uh, was looking for my, uh, my mirror and it was nothing but a handful of dust, nothing but a handful of dust. And as I looked down, I noticed that's where all my wounds were on that side. So that thing probably saved my, uh, some, some injuries. Uh, so I didn't, have, I didn't have a signal mirror. I went into my first aid kit because I had a very badly lacerated knee. My arms were pretty well beat up. And so I took some sulfa tablets and I figured, you know, I'd seen it in a movie one time. Really, honestly, I'd seen it in a movie. Sulfa is supposed to kill potential, uh, uh, potential uh, infection. So I took a couple of three pills like that, buried what was left, and I ran up the hill. I ran up the hill to get away from these guys. Because uh, I could hear them coming. I could hear the dogs. And I got up the top of this little ridge, top of this little ridge, and I couldn't go any further because there was a lot of undergrowth, a lot of trees, uh, uh, brambles, uh, things like that, bushes. And so I, uh, I looked for a place to hide. Uh, I looked back down the hill and I saw this little banana palm. It was about nine inches in diameter. And of course, you can see I'm wider than nine inches. And I says, well, I got to hide someplace. So I squeezed myself down behind this little banana palm. And I'm wearing my olive drab colored flight suit. So I'm kind of blending in. So I squished down behind this banana palm and I started praying and keeping quiet. 
and a whole bunch of them went right by me. Dogs, people, everybody. And then I didn't hear any noise after a while, and I thought, well, they probably reached the same undergrowth, the same uh, impediments that I reached, and they can't go any further. And it was true. That's what happened. Then they all turned around, and they looked back down the hill, and then all hell broke loose. Oh, screaming and hollering, and they all surrounded me. There must have been about a dozen of them. They had these old beat-up rifles. Stripped me down to my undershorts, bloody undershorts, and, and one of those uh, tank top undershirts, and took my pistol, my, uh, the $5 that I had. Uh, I had a religious medal, which they took away. Uh, I think I missed that one more than anything else. Uh, I've been given in, in uh, Catholic school. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, get, left me my socks, gave me a stick, and then marched me off to the village. Okay, uh, watched me off to the village. And uh, there's where I sat for about an hour and a half or so uh, until the army arrived with their Hummer-type uh, big Jeep vehicle. Threw me and the navigator in there, and we drove on in to uh, Hanoi. Drove all night uh, and got there about 5.30 in the morning. And uh, I went in to a, to a place called uh, New Guy Village. That's where the interrogation took place. Uh, New Guy Village was the uh, location where everybody entered uh, the Hanoi Hilton. And in Vietnamese, it's called Wa Lo, which means burning furnace. And well, I'll tell you, it, it gets very hot in there in more ways than one. But anyway, I went into this room, and uh, uh, the navigator and I were split Two different, uh, two different interrogation rooms. And the guy that came into my room uh, was a fellow we later nicknamed, uh, I found, from the old guys, the Eagle. And the Eagle was very bright, very, very smart uh, in military uh, information, knew his, knew his stuff. And he brought in with him a little guy, which we nicknamed later on the Monkey Man, uh, which was uh, sort of a low-grade NCO. And he just followed the instructions, which I'll elucidate on here just shortly, of the interrogator. Now, when you become captured, when you become captured in a military scenario, so to speak, uh, there are two purposes you know, for in interrogation. There are two types. Number one is for military information because it's perishable. Uh, they don't want to know yesterday's targets or they don't want to know yesterday's intelligence information because it doesn't do them any good tomorrow. When you know when you plan a defense, when you plan a defense uh, uh, establishment, when you put a defense establishment together and uh, you're going to, uh, for instance, the United States, protect the United States, uh, your intelligence has to be based upon what the threat not only is today, but what it is potentially in the foreseeable future. And that's what they were after here. They wanted to know what were the targets going to be after Tet. Now, all of you heard of the, what Tet, uh, heard of Tet before? The Lunar New Year, okay? It's like the Chinese New Year. We just finished one uh, uh, recently. Not us, the United States, but the, the Asian people did. Anyway, uh, the Lunar New Year was about to take place. Well, uh, the two types, of course, of, of intelligence I want to get back to again are uh, interrogation, or number one, in, uh, military intelligence, because it's perishable, and number two, propaganda. Propaganda, uh, I'll, I'll talk about later on, but uh, we're not, right now, we're engaging here in this description on military intelligence. Lyndon Johnson, when he was president, didn't understand the guy that I described ran North Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh, didn't understand him. He listened instead to his uh, Harvard-educated advisors and all these people that told him, if we stop bombing over the North, we will then entice them in good faith to come to the negotiating table and we can get this war over with. We can settle it through negotiations. Very, very, very bad assumption. Because as I mentioned, Ho Chi Minh since 1930 had this ambition that he was going to unify and keep unified uh, Vietnam. So what Lyndon Johnson did was we're gonna say, he said, we're gonna stop the bombing over the North for Christmas, our Christmas, the Lunar New Year, the Tet Festival, okay? 
and of course over uh, the New Year's holiday as well. Okay, and that was supposed to bring them to the negotiating table. So, the bombing stopped. This interrogator said to me, what are the targets going to be after Tet? I am the foggiest idea. I am the foggiest idea. I used to sit on what we call our frag teams. We would take, uh, the, from the Joint Chiefs, we would take the targets that we were gonna strike, but I had no idea what they, they were. All we did was write the coordinates down, and then we'd put them in, a, in, uh, in uh, strike packages, and we'd give them to the appropriate crews. Okay? Particularly, it was for the uh, uh, B-66 people, so we'd know where the jamming should be oriented in order to support the 105s and the F-4s uh, in their strikes. So, the guy is asking me, the Eagle is asking me, number one, what are the, what are the targets after Tet? I said, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the little guy we called the monkey man then, uh, in following instructions, came across and gave me a good slap across the face, the left side. Came from my left side and gave me a good hard one. Now, when I went through survival school over at the old Stead Air Force Base outside of Reno, uh, we were taught that they will try to intimidate you in order to get you past the name, rank, service number, and date of birth. Okay? So this slap, this slap after I had, I had told him uh, only my name, rank, service number, and my date of birth, and not my unit, which he asked me for, slapped me alongside the face, and I thought to myself, this is exactly the way it's supposed to be. I'm gonna to prove to be too tough a nut, they're gonna put me then into the big compound with the rest of the hard nuts, and they'll just forget me and the war will be over and I'll go home. Then he asked me again, he said, what was your unit? And I said, I can't tell you that, so I got another slap alongside the face. And then uh, I was asked a third time, what is your unit? which happened to be the 41st uh, TAC Recon Squadron. I said, I don't know. He didn't slap me this time. Young man, why don't you come up here? I want to show you something. And, uh, and I, I'm doing this just to give you an example of the extremes that, uh, that people who are in battle will go to in order to protect their, their country, okay? Anyway, what happened was, uh, this uh, monkey man took handcuffs and he put them on my, my wrists, put them on my wrists, opposing, okay? And they weren't the, the handcuffs that have the chain between the two loops. These were uh, kind of like miniature stocks, very rigid cuffs. So he put that like so, and then he took this, just imagine this is a long strap, and he took a strap in here, He um, took the strap then and, and he tied it off here. I'm going to use my belt. And then what he did, what he did then was lace this strap back and forth across my arms. Now, just picture this young fella sitting on his rear end with his legs extended and then being rolled on his side and each time that I have the strap laced, I pull it tight and tight and tighter and tighter and tighter until I get up here. And what, th what happens is the elbows, of course, get pulled to touching one another. And then he took the strap over the top, what he had left, over my shoulder, and he tied it around my ankles and cinched it up until I was, my nose was touching my knees. Now, Freddie Idle will tell you, thank you. Freddie Idle will tell you. <laughs> Freddie Idle will tell you that being athletes, uh, we are generally a little more supple and a little more limber than non-athletes. And I was uh, an athlete, I was a distance runner, and I played football, and so I was always in pretty fair shape. So the bending and touching my nose to my knees wasn't the hard part. The most painful, most difficult part of that whole thing is that 
not even pulling my elbows to touch one another, not even uh, the, uh, the handcuffs. The most painful part was that when you cinch down that nylon strap, you cut off all the circulation, the blood circulation to your limbs. And you all know that if through experience that when you cut off the circulation, it hurts like the daylights. It really hurts. So after they had tied me up, they both got up without any emotion whatsoever. And this is the thing that I felt hard. Uh, I, I felt, I felt uh, 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 most severely, if you want to say that, is that there was no emotion in these guys. These guys were just going about their job, just going about their job in extracting information. So they both got up and they walked out. And the pain's starting to build up now. And I always thought I was pretty tough. I always thought I was pretty tough. But you know, in American athletics, for instance, for young guys, uh, they're going through high school and, and uh, even in college and all that stuff, when the play's over, everybody stops. And you go back to the huddle, or you rest a while, and then you go through it again. Uh, or uh, the referee blows a whistle. There are rules. There were no rules in this experience that I had. I, this was the hardest thing I had to, to, that I could uh, uh, grasp. Very difficult. Anyway, they just left me there. So I thought I was pretty tough, but I didn't last and hold out as long as I thought I could. So I screamed and hollered, so after about 20, 25 minutes, I guess, something like that. Really hurt. They came back in again, and they untied me. Now, I don't know really which is more painful, cutting off the circulation and laying there, or when they untie you from this contraption, feeling all that circulation just surge back into your limbs again, because it's, it, it's pretty painful. So I staggered to my feet. The eagle took his seat again. The monkey man stood off to my left where he was previously, and the eagle said, okay, what, are, what is your unit? I, I thought to myself, for, to this day, I, I'm uh, truthful with you when I say I, I can hear my words to myself. Fur, you're a wimp. You, you gave in too soon. You gave in too soon. I really, really had a guilt trip. So I told him, I just gritted my teeth and I said, I can't tell you what my unit is. Back into the straps again, okay. Cinched me all up, just as I described, and they walked out. And this time when I screamed and hollered, they didn't come back right away. When they finally did come back, untie me, I said, okay, I'm in the 41st squadron, attack recon squadron. He says, okay, now once again my question, what are, the, what are the targets after Tet? I had no idea. I said, I don't know. He didn't think that was, he, he didn't think that was a good answer. I went back in the straps a third time. By this time, I was pretty well wrung out, pretty well wrung out. Uh, when he asked me after they untied me, uh, what are the, the, the targets after Tet, Lunar New Year, I said, um, oil storage. I just made up something. Uh, the barges, I said, uh, the, the oil tr the trucks uh, hauling oil, uh, the uh, imports, uh, we're going after oil. And the reason I said it was because uh, I had read it uh, uh, the previous week or so in Stars and Stripes, the newspaper. So I figured it was probably a pretty good, uh, it was probably a pretty good answer, so he bought it. I went through the rest of the day with innocuous questions about when are the B-52s coming to, to Thailand, uh, down south of Bangkok there. Uh, Utapau is a, a place where there's a base. They built a base down there for B-52s so they wouldn't have to fly a long bombing uh, mission from uh, Guam. So we, uh, he wanted to know, the interrogator wanted to know, when are the B-52s coming down there? Uh, and so uh, I told him, I don't know, I don't know into the straps again. So I made up something. I said, uh, in, in six months, in six months. So he'd write it down. Now, one of the things you have to understand too is, he, uh, with, with, with air crews, that means you have multiple sources of interrogation. So when he put the navigator in one room, he put me in another room, and they had one of those electronic warfare officers in a third room, what this guy was doing, he was going from room, when he left me, 
to stew there in the straps, he was going to the other rooms one at a time and he was asking them the same question. And he was trying to correlate everything. And interrogators, interrogators write down everything. They write down everything. And then they get together with the other interrogators and they compare stories. Now, one of the underlying uh, aspects that you have to practice when you get bumped off of what we call position one, name, rank, service number, date of birth, which under the Geneva Convention you're obligated to give, okay? Once you get bumped off and you have to go to uh, position two, which is giving of inaccurate, misleading, or erroneous information, quote unquote, which is what survival's all about, survival school's all about, when you back off and you're on position two, you've got to remember what you told them. Remember the uh, pilots usually know the, the KISS principle. I wonder if the rest of you do. K-I-S-S, keep it simple, stupid. Okay? So that's what you have to do. You have to make up a story that's erroneous, inaccurate, and misleading on a particular question, but you've got to remember what you gave them because they write it down. Okay, so the first day was completely military intelligence completely military intelligence, because I mentioned to you, it's perishable. At night, I slept on the tile floor. They gave me a, 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 a blanket, cotton blanket. I was still in my shorts and my undershirt and my socks, okay? And they brought in, they brought in a plate of white rice and a cup of tea, about a 14 ounce cup of tea. I didn't touch any of it. I had no appetite whatsoever. I sat down at the stool, on the stool though, and I looked on the top of this table in which there were a lot of words and sketches and scratches. And off to one side was a little, uh, a short sentence that said, all POWs learn this code. I thought, learn this code. And I looked and scratched on the table was a five by five matrix of our alphabet. And I thought, uh, I don't know what that, what does that mean? What does that mean? This is a five by five. Now there are 25 letters there to make it five by five. The 26th letter is K and it's omitted. I just sort of parked it away in the back of my, my mind. The next day, the political interrogator came in and wanted to know uh, the information I told you about, where I was born, what my father did, uh, mother uh, did, all that sort of stuff, and uh, my schooling, all of that routine, and who I knew. What famous people did I know? So for want of a better answer, I wrote down that I know Hubert Humphrey who at the time, you know, was LBJ's vice president. They never followed up on it to see if they could exploit that for some political purpose. But anyway, that whole day there was all political stuff, indoctrination, uh, trying to get me what we call crossover to the people's side, in other words, collaborate. The third day, I was uh, moved up to another camp what we call Little Vegas. Now, Little Vegas was part of the Hanoi Hilton, or Wallo, in which the cell blocks were all named after Las Vegas casinos. The reason it got those names is not because somebody plucked them out of the, sky, of the, of the air, was because most of the pilots who were shot down were F-105 pilots. And the F-105 pilots went through the uh, flight school the air to ground and all that stuff at Nellis Air Force Base, which is just outside Las Vegas. Now, I moved up into Little Vegas. I moved into a, 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 a big room. I was still in solitary confinement. I moved into a big room, and I heard some voices one night. Uh, I was, I'd been there about two nights or so. I heard some voices uh, speaking American English uh, outside the cell. So there was a table, and I pushed this table up against the window, climbed on the table, and I listened, and I heard him talking again, and I said, who is that out there? They got quiet. Because if you're, if you're, 
if you were caught communicating, it, it went tough on you. The Vietnamese were really tough. Everything had to be non-com stuff. Anyway, I said, who's there? A second time. And Sam Baker, it turns out, who used to be a Thunderbird and uh, excellent pilot, he said, who was that over there? I told him, it's John Furr. He said, what's your serial number? He's going to check on me. So I told him what my serial number was. Back then it wasn't Social Security, it was a serial number. And he said, uh, when were you shot down? And I said, on the 4th of February. And then he said, this year? I said, yes. Which I said, what year would it be? And he says, do you know the tap code? A light bulb went on. I says, that's the code they were talking about. I said, yes. He says, get on the wall. So what I did was picked up my bar of soap, which I had been issued, and I found, believe it or not, a rusty nail on the ground, on the floor. And I, and I, knew, I, I knew I did not know this thing by heart. And I walked over to the to the wall, I put my ear up against the wall, my ear against the wall, and Sam started talking by tapping. And I copied the letters down on my bar of soap. And then I'd rotate it to the, uh, the, the narrow side, and I'd copy, and I'd keep rotating it through, and uh, got the message that he was Sam Johnson. He'd gotten shot down in 1965. So what he started tapping was this code, and the way you do it is you tap a number of taps for the row and for then the column. So you go, if you want to tap an A, you would tap one and then a second tap. So you tap a slight hesitation and the second. And you get real good at this, you can go you can go real quick through this thing, and you can communicate very well. If you wanted to do a B, for instance, the, the, the uh, horizontal would be okay, two for the row and then one for the column. Communication is very important because it underlaid uh, uh, under the primary purpose of setting up an organization, and that is to resist exploitation for, pro 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 for propaganda purposes by the enemy. Because what they want to do is they want to get you to collaborate, they want you to make political statements, they want you to give them information on the camp structure and the organization, things like that. All sorts of different reasons, okay? So you want to organize, but first before you organize, you have to communicate. And this was the perfect means to start communication. Now, uh, let me give you a humorous example uh, and on how you can mess that up, too. Uh, you, remember I told you my eyes were badly damaged uh, for a, a, a short period of time? Well, I piggybacked that. I piggybacked that on, along with, along with a tick and what I'm doing right now, whenever I went into interrogations, and the fact that I couldn't see to read or write, because the greatest fear in my entire life was to be forced, one way or another, to write a propaganda statement against my country. When I got shot down, eyes are bad, I picked up the tick, you know, and the twitch, and all that sort of thing, and that's what I kept so that I wouldn't have to be forced to write or to even read propaganda on the radio, because some POWs are forced to do that. As it gets tapped through the wall to some guys, they hear F-A-C-E. So when I moved into a room, a new room, uh, uh, J.B. McCamey, who was a Navy commander, he said, how are your eyes? And I said, they're fine. He said, uh, have they gotten any worse? I said, no, they've never been bad. He said, well, we got the word through the tap code that you were going blind. And I asked him, I said, well, how did the message come through? Fur faces blindness. That's the way it was sent through the camp. 
Well, if you use a C for faces blindness instead of the K for fakes blindness, you can see how it would get distorted. So I straightened them out there, and of course when the word went out, it was all clarified. So the big thing that ended the war, I think, was the bombing of Hanoi by the B-52s and other airplanes in um, 1972. And we were told in, uh, in early January uh, that it was about to be signed. When it was signed, it was required that within five days we be told when we were going home. And they did. Vietnamese followed it closely. So I came home on the 4th of March, right to the date of uh, 73 months. And I came home on a day that I had hoped I would come home on. And that is a miserable, overcast, rainy, crummy day. Because I want, that's how I wanted to remember that place. Uh, and um, they've dressed it up now. I understand from people who paid visits there, they've dressed it up to make it uh, look like a hotel. Uh, but uh, it wasn't a hotel back then. Do I remain in contact with any of the former POWs? Uh, I did, in a sense, when I went to John McCain's election night <laughs> thing down in Arizona. Uh, it wasn't a very happy reunion between the two of us but uh, because of the outcome of the election, but uh, he's a dear friend of mine. Uh, 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 there's a, uh, uh, one of my roommates um, who's with Raytheon back on the East Coast. I communicate with him. Um, John Reynolds, good friend. Um, uh, my closest uh, POW uh, friend right now uh, is because we, uh, fate just threw us together here, is uh, Ken Huey. Uh, Ken Huey is an attorney. He came back from Vietnam and went to law school. And he's an attorney uh, for, the, for the county prosecutor over in Long Beach. Did you tell everyone that you received the Silver Star, the Distinguished Flying Cross, and the Purple Heart? That's no. only a few? No. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we just wanted to present this That's to you, you. and a year's membership oh, and complimentary great. pass so that you'll Thank come you. back. I will. And I will. Uh, we all feel very honored that you were with us today. And please come forward and ask John further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About here at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. I'm Betty Wheaton. I'll see you next time.